Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ezekiel Dixon Roman, and welcome to the Control Society Speaker Series. Um, this speaker series is co-curated by myself and Jessa Lingle and supported by a Provost Excellence Through Diversity Fund grant, the School of Social Policy and Practice, the Annenberg uh, School for Communication, and the Price Lab for Digital Humanities. Today we had the honor, I have, we had the honor to bring to you Ingrid Burrington. Ingrid is an artist who writes, makes maps, and tells jokes about places, politics, and the weird feelings people have about both. She's the author of Networks of New York, an illustrated field guide to urban internet infrastructure, and has previously written for The Atlantic, The Nation, The Verge, and other outlets. Her writing ranges from clear, accessible, and tangible descriptions of the ubiquity of the Internet of Things to the politically timely and provocative musings of putting political theorist Hannah Arendt to work on, contemporary political, on, on our contemporary political moment. If you haven't read this, uh, this, uh, this article, it's a really good one where she's literally taking Hannah Arendt's um, uh, classical text, The Origins of Totalitarianism, and putting it in conversation with specifically, actually, uh, this was during... Um, the, right before the 2016 election. Exactly. It's the only listicle I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great one, no. Um, her work has previously been supported by iBeam Art and Technology Center, the Center for Land Use Interpretation, and Rhizome. She also runs the Data and Society Speculative Fiction Reading Group. Today, she will be giving a talk on Zuckerberg in The Hague. Please join me in welcoming Ingrid Burrington. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, I. Uh, well, hello. I guess I kind of wanted to give a little bit of caveats because I realized that titling a talk Zuckerberg in the Hague was maybe slightly provocative. Um, and I'm going to be talking through some ideas that are underlying new work, work in progress, primarily happening um, in collaboration with my colleague Surya Matu at a project we're doing at iBeam under the aegis of a residency um, that is supposedly for the future of journalism. I don't know what the future of journalism means. Um, I don't think anyone does. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, like, I don't know, one of the weird privileges of being a person in a creative profession is that you get to kind of maintain a state of perpetual professional amateurism. Um, I am not a lawyer. I am not a policy person. Um, I'm not a media scholar. And so, um, I don't know, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to share what I'm working from and hopefully learn from, you know, actual experts like all of you. So, you know, let's, let's do this. Um, you know, after the 2016 election, like uh, many other people, I found myself drawn to escapist media. Um, this is some examples. My, my preferred genres of escapist media tended to be speculative fiction and science fiction, and uh, writings and histories of transitional justice projects, um, which is to say sort of war crimes tribunals, truth and reconciliation commissions, the, the systems and bureaucracies constructed kind of in the aftermath of massive political upheaval and traumatic sort of national events. Um, and usually, I don't know, I think of transitional justice actually kind of as its own genre of speculative fiction. It surely is its own kind of world building, um, perhaps more in the vernacular of law than in the vernacular of literature or design. And the thing I guess I find compelling about both, about speculative narrative and transitional justice, is, is not that either is useful for kind of finding a simple solution or creating a perfect world. Both are fraught and both fail frequently. Um, but it's maybe the, the idea that both kind of suggest a belief that kind of regardless of whether the future is dystopian or utopian, it will in fact happen. Um, and although we kind of may never fully come to terms with, you know, traumatic or cataclysmic events, they will not be paralyzing society in perpetuity because, I don't know, I find it to be personally a rather paralyzing present, right? Like despite kind of the tumult and sound and fury of a media cycle, despite the perpetual sort of like drumbeat of technological progress, there is a sense that that it is kind of right now a very ahistorical and anodyne environment. And, and some of that, but not all, I think might be attributed to living um, and experiencing those events in relationship to a very ahistorical and anodyne uh, interfaces, right? Um, this was a feature that Slate did last year called the year in push alerts. That was one of the most like kind of like painful interactives to watch because it kind of reminded me of that experience that maybe some of you have had of like picking up the phone with a sense of dread of like what fresh hell has unfolded, 
and then swiping it away with your thumb, which feels sort of like not quite the appropriate gesture of response. Um, and I, I think of the kind of various technical apparatuses and regimes that have been part of this sort of like anodyne ahistorical tendency, Facebook is probably the easiest to pick on. Um, and so I feel kind of bad centering what I'm going to be talking about around that. But I think one of the reasons that uh, like relative to kind of all the other soulless tech platforms that increasingly shape public life, they're one of the more compelling. It's that kind of more than any of these other companies, their public image is really grounded in this, this earnest attempt to embody a rhetoric of authenticity um, and do things for kind of a greater social good and kind of always just sort of get it wrong. Um, this is... You need to remind yourself that you need to focus and, um, and try not to let stuff bother you as much as possible. But it is going to bother you because you're human. And, and I was human. I am human, still. Um, but, um, but, it, but I was just referring to myself in the past. Um, not that I was not human. Uh, and I just had to share that with you all. Um, my, my friend and colleague, Tim Malley, was once explaining to me a scenario from a Dungeons and Dragons campaign um, in which a monster comes to your party and takes one of the members of your, of your group and, and kills them and turns their skin into a suit and then rejoins your party. And you all know, it's pretty obvious, this is a monster wearing a skin suit. But you can't quite say anything yet because if you give away the game, something, you know, like he'll, the monster will just attack. And Tim was explaining this and he said, this is sort of how I feel about interacting with brands online. Um, and I feel like that's, that kind of is often how I think about Facebook as sort of this monster in a skin suit trying to be human. Um, and if you kind of acknowledge that it isn't, something terrible will happen. Um, and I think, but I think, again, maybe just as much as kind of Facebook is kind of this fish in a barrel sort of subject, I think the ways in which they institutionalize and absorb language of critique or the language that might be applied to try and hold them accountable as a body is really compelling. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. Um, so this is the Building Global Community blog post that Mark Zuckerberg published in February of 2017. Um, it was one of several examples of you know, Facebook post-election going, perhaps we have power. We don't know how to think about this. And the thing I found really fascinating about the blog post was um, the amount of times that Zuckerberg brought up infrastructure. And specifically, 15 times he uses this phrase, social infrastructure. Um, sometimes he talks about safety infrastructure, by which he means like the, the safety check-in feature, the like something bad happened, are you OK thing. Um, and sometimes he sort of tries to like categorize variations of social infrastructure. But like it's sort of throughout the whole thing assumed that, that those two words are an agreed upon term that requires no definition, no interrogation, no taxonomy. I, I read this blog post a few times, and I still don't really know what Mark Zuckerberg thinks social infrastructure is, other than maybe Facebook. Um, at one point, it's sort of like, it sounds like he like read the Wikipedia summary of Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, and is like, we used to be in clubs, and now we're not. Social infrastructure, got it. Um, but then he sort of uses a definition that sounds a little more how a state might describe social infrastructure, like libraries or schools or prisons. Um, and then at other points, it sounds more like he's talking about software features, like the safety check-in or like authentication of identity. And the, the fuzziness of that term is really fascinating to me as someone whose previous work had largely been about kind of the materiality of network infrastructure, like the actual stuff of the internet, like data centers and their geographies. Um, and you know, I want to be clear, despite being sort of a grubby materialist, I don't necessarily think that uh, Mark Zuckerberg was using the word infrastructure correctly or incorrectly, and I'm not sure that entirely matters. But I, I and I, I don't know, I really appreciate Paul Edwards's like understanding and framing of infrastructure as environment in his essay, Infrastructure and Modernity. Um, but I do think that it's sort of interesting that kind of, for all of the frequency with which platforms and, and large tech companies either kind of by, like themselves or via like kind of other speakers invoke the infrastructural, rarely are they described as sort of legally liable when that infrastructure breaks. Um, this was, they actually, in 2009, I think Facebook changed their slogan from move fast and break things to uh, move fast with stable infra. It never really caught on. Um, but, you know, when, when a car hits a pothole, 
and flips over, the person who is responsible for maintaining the road is usually kind of held liable for that, that particular harm. When Facebook makes it possible to buy advertisements that violate the Fair Housing Act, they sort of just promise they're going to not do that anymore um, and, and make some like kind of public statements, but very little changes. And there is sort of, as someone who kind of traffics in like the world of people kind of reporting on large tech companies, there's this very familiar and increasingly, I find tiresome pattern to this sort of reporting, which is first, a journalist or security researcher or policy advocate discovers a flaw or technical loophole or dark pattern that perpetuates harm. Um, and then, you know, after publishing documentation of said harm, the reporting produces this sort of meta reporting, which eventually leads to the company doing kind of one of two things, either sort of promising that they're going to fix it, which they may or may not actually do, or sort of a like, I'm sorry you feel that way apology um, that usually kind of gently gestures to the terms of service and, and moves on. Um, and you know, generally, like rarely do these sort of things lead to like substantive internal change. Um, and if there are lawsuits, they're usually settled out of court for sums that, you know, while sometimes kind of large, I think one of the bigger ones was like nine and a half million, that's effectively, you know, pocket change for a company like Facebook. Um, and then, you know, when, it, when we kind of get towards regulatory frameworks, which, you know, you might see in Europe and sometimes in the United States, but really mostly you're seeing FTC settlement agreements, um, companies tend to fight or find loopholes around them um, or find a way to kind of rhetorically position themselves. This is a, a blog post uh, that was published fairly recently by, on Facebook's newsroom that didn't get a lot of play, which is called popularity does not equal dominance, which is a very confusing argument for why they're not a monopoly, uh, which is like, just people like us. I, it's not, we're not the only platform. There are others, you know, some of which we don't own. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So last year, there was a particular kind of genre of moral outrage at, you know, a platform's ambiguously defined harms that I found uniquely compelling because of its kind of weird vector with, with incidents that are typically associated with and documented in transitional justice processes. Um, so you may have seen these stories. So last summer, YouTube rolled out this new machine learning approach to identifying, detecting extremist content or disturbing content on its platform to delete it. Um, and in the process, they removed thousands of videos that had been cataloged and collected by groups like the Syrian Archive and other groups that were trying to gather this not only to kind of understand what was actually going on in Syria, but also for the possibility of kind of future war crimes tribunals. Um, similar incidents were happening not only on YouTube, but also content was being taken down on Facebook as like violating their community standards because it was considered disturbing. Um, and similar community standard takedowns were happening um, to people trying to document incidents of ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, a related story, kind of a few months after a lot of the, the YouTube stories were happening, was um, documenting how basically given the sort of monopoly status that Facebook occupies, in Myanmar because internet adoption happened rather late. Primarily it's made via cell phones. There are more people with Facebook accounts than email addresses in Myanmar. It has an, a unique position as kind of like determining what information kind of rises to the top of people's kind of understanding of what's happening in the world. And by extension kind of was legitimizing and pushing forward further content that was justifying, you know, ethnic cleansing. Um, and I, Sorry. And you know, whether or not there will someday be a tribunal for crimes against humanity taking place in Myanmar or in Syria or anywhere, um, and who will operate said tribunal, and whether or not videos collected via social media will be deemed valid evidence in said tribunal's court of law are like really thorny, uncertain questions, and not necessarily the questions we need to lay it at the feet of Google or Facebook. But I think the disappearance of that evidence from platforms and the kind of uncomfortable amount of, you know, infrastructural, for lack of a better word, kind of presence companies have in these situations, um, it creates this sort of, I don't know, foreclosure on even kind of the idea of pursuing that imperfect thorny justice, right? The foreclosure on kind of a certain possibility of a future, which is itself also not really a crime. Like there are no laws about a human right to history and canceling the future is not itself a crime against humanity.
Um, and I think in general, this approach, the sort of name and shame, like point out this terrible thing, feel bad about it, that strategy in some short term senses is actually really smart. Like I think the guy who's working on that intercept piece, his main goal was like, he wanted YouTube to answer the Syrian archives emails and he got it. And like, that's great in that particular kind of one to one triage situation. There are lots of situations that are, are not that straightforward. And there are lots of causes and lots of you know, international incidents that don't reach a journalist. Not a lot of people speak Burmese. Um, and this is something that, I don't know, I naively, you know, innocent, not a lawyer me, felt a little bit baffled because I, I don't know, I sort of hoped that at the point where you start talking about things like literally war crimes, that like some adults would start to show up, that like legal liability would have to emerge. Um, the adults do not show up. <laughs> There, there are, the adults have no idea what to do. And I, I ended up talking to a bunch of lawyers and writing this sort of long reported essay that got a title that sort of feels like the thing that you do so that you can get people on Facebook to notice it. Um, I, I really wish that it had a more nuanced title because the answer is no um, and probably never. Um, and that's really all there is to it. I didn't, um, and this was for The Atlantic back in December. Um, I wasn't really just trying to kind of take three and a half thousand words to answer the question of like, why would suing Facebook fail? Although that's more or less what I did. Um, really what I wanted to kind of understand was like why and how Facebook in particular, but tech platforms in general, corporations in general, you know, are able to utilize law to effectively act outside of it. And how platforms have constructed this reality um, or contributed to the kind of further perpetuation of a reality in which, you know, everyone's sorry, but no one's really responsible. And, you know, of course, it, I, I'm going to try not to over recap this because, like, it's on the internet, you can read it, but, like, you know, most of the methods used by a company like Facebook to avoid liability aren't actually all that different from how, like, a company like ExxonMobil doesn't face liability. And it's really not that different from the reasons that a company like IBM never faced real liability for like its role in facilitating the Holocaust. Um, you know, the Nuremberg principles were this huge step forward for challenging the defense of individuals who were just following orders, but we still don't really have a way to challenge corporations who were just following the instructions of the invisible hand of the marketplace. And I, I think this is maybe a way of just kind of belaboring the point that many of these issues are not new. They seem new given kind of the veneer of tech and given sort of new parameters of present conflicts and specific kind of like subtleties of law, like the diff like Section 230 is a, of the Communications Decency Act we were talking about earlier. Um, and so I, I don't know. I've been working on this project, kind of trying to understand Facebook as a sort of legal animal and apparatus, and thinking through some of these older kind of precedents and existing legal paradigms as a way to maybe think about moving out of merely thinking about kind of platform accountability and trying to kind of position it more deliberately adversarially within liability. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of kind of points to that, like reasons why I think that that's useful and strategies I've been thinking about it more as, um, more as creative narrative projects than necessarily uh, law. So kind of step one. One of the, the central tropes of discussing holding Facebook accountable for its actions as a company that I tend to notice with other kind of media scholars and, and, so, and like people who work in journalism is if we could just get them to admit that they're a media company, that would, that would work. That would, that would fix a lot of things. And it would insofar as it would introduce a lot of regulatory expectations on them. And there would be certain laws that they would be kind of subject to that they're not right now about like libel and safe harbor and things. Um, but Facebook is a company that's extremely cognizant of the importance of not being framed as a media company, right? Like they go to great lengths to not do that. Um, you know, I think there's a reason that Facebook leans so heavily on concepts like community and infrastructure, which are pointedly not the same as public or public works. Um, it's kind of nice to remember that like as far back as like 2006, Facebook was referring to itself frequently as a social utility, um, which is a phrase they drop. This is, um, so Suri and I have been reading every version of the Facebook Terms of Service and basically track changing them, which is like a really weird Talmudic way to try and like interpret all of the subtleties of what it is to make a corporation. Um, they dropped the social utility language entirely by 2009. And I think, you know, you could kind of argue that they might have realized that, you know, if they continue to kind of signal 
that they you know signal this sort of like idea of utilities they might actually start getting regulated like one or people might continue to think that perhaps they should be um so i don't want to say that the strategy of how do we make facebook a media company is like a meaningless one like i think it's it's you know worth trying or pursuing but i feel like it's no more quixotic than saying like what if we tried to, you know, focus on like using civil negligence, like standards and like tort law? You know, I, I don't really just don't think either is like any more or less ridiculous. Um, and I don't know, I think about this uh, thing that Sarah Henry, a designer, um, an artist who I really admire, said in a commencement speech a few years ago that, that I think seeing the company for what it actually is, seeing platforms for what they actually are, which are corporations, um, not chimera, not like, magic, not communities, not media companies, is maybe a useful way to try and actually think through what it is to try and change or attack them. The second kind of component that I've been thinking through that I feel like I don't often see brought into accountability and I think might have opportunities in liability is um, money. Um, so, you know, for the most part, the, the kind of pursuit of kind of policy transparency and better kind of access to data and regulatory regimes, I think are good in so far as they tend to be about trying to create conditions where the harms may not happen in the future. Um, but in the case of kind of things like regulation for hate speech um, or speech that's inciting violence, um, a lot of the existing proposed frameworks of kind of like fining the company when they don't take something down, like the thing in Germany, um, it sort of just moves power asymmetry around rather than kind of redistributing or changing the power dynamics, right? Like either the state is deciding what speech is acceptable or Facebook is in this ad hoc way deciding what speech is acceptable and both kind of the user still kind of doesn't have a lot of like agency or feels very little recourse from harm when that, that's sort of your paradigm. Like the fines are not going to like the individual user who like was subject to a harassment campaign, for instance. Um, and, you know, putting Facebook's wealth into the hands of citizens isn't quite the same as putting power and agency into their hands, but I think it's maybe a useful way to think about what, it, what is the kind of power language that we can use. This is Laurel Patak's uh, Wages for Facebook, which is a, a website and artwork essay that she made, I think, in 2014, I want to say. It's a website that just sort of, like, voluntarily scrolls through this text kind of inspired by the Wages for Housework manifesto. Um, you know, because whether we think Facebook is a media company or a data broker, like at the end of the day, it's a corporation and that means its primary concern and preferred language and vernacular is money. Um, I think that it's, it sounds sort of cutthroat, but I think trying to kind of, rather than saying like, let's just like destroy the company or let's change the company, but let's actually try and like deal with the fact that they have entirely too much money is a potentially useful strategy. And I also think maybe one approach to thinking about what it, how to actually enact self-regulation, right? Like if you can make um, it really expensive and tedious and annoying, like one example that I, I look to is um, the uh, French railway system that, you know, went through its own kind of process of understanding, like kind of documenting and coming to terms with its role in facilitating the Holocaust. It wasn't until 2014 that they set up kind of a reparations fund for survivors. And there were many, many, many lawsuits prior to that. And they fought them. And sometimes they won and sometimes they settled. But at a certain point, like fighting all of those lawsuits sort of ceases to work. And they kind of finally kind of accepted responsibility for their actions. It may or may not work. Um, this third thing is, and there are kind of institutions that are thinking about how to take these sorts of strategies. The Knight First Amendment Center is one that comes to mind because I understand lawsuits are expensive and that's why this approach does not tend to come up that often. Um, so the way that I've been thinking through this as someone who is not a lawyer, not a policy person, a person who tells stories has largely been going back to my, my deep love of speculative fiction. Um, I hope for those, I don't know if I need to explain this joke too much. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think that kind of positioning creative and investigative work that exists not in this world, but perhaps like kind of in a world where these previous two concepts of like, well, previous two concepts. I didn't read that part of the text. I'm going through this a lot faster than I thought I did. I didn't know I had this much time when I initially agreed to give this talk. So I apologize in advance. You're doing great. Am I? OK, yeah. thanks. Cool. Um, so I think, you know, the, the point, be, like the thing that I wanted to get at here was 
basically rather than kind of approaching these propositions that I've been putting forward as like, wouldn't it be great if like this happened? Because like I don't actually have the resources to make a lot of those things happen. How do I kind of construct a reality in which they already happened? Like what does that world actually look like? And that's sort of the position in writing, like we've been writing this sort of annotated like history of like components of Facebook. And like I have this spreadsheet just called every shitty Facebook thing um, that is longer, it's actually exactly as long as you'd think. And rather than writing about it as like, be mad, it's like, remember, can you believe we did this for so long? Like, it's kind of about kind of how you position the narrative. Um, and one frame of reference for that, like that I found useful has been kind of from more speculative fiction and design and art. Um, last winter, I curated a show at a Haverford College on speculative design um, and art practices called Future Proof. And the work that I found kind of, that like was the reason I did the show. Um, this is an important was was this project, the show that gave me the idea for like even the premise of like put a bunch of weird futurist projects in the same room. Um, this is uh, the Guantanamo Bay Museum of Art and History, which is a project by Ian Allen Paul. Um, and it started kind of as a one liner thing in 2012, like a stunt where he said, all right, so assuming that, you know, Barack Obama was able to get Guantanamo closed, what will we do with it? Right? What will we actually do with that site? Assuming that you know you could kind of get that political groundswell. And so Ian constructed an exhibition of a, a satellite show from the collective of curators, archivists, and activists who managed to you know, construct a museum in the same way that in kind of a similar vein as like the Stasi Museum in East Berlin. Um, and the thing that's sort of weird about making a museum about a political event that has not in fact yet happened and almost certainly won't happen is that it kind of, he kept getting asked to show the project, like it toured and like it kind of other iterations, like the museum has had many exhibitions in this very long life while at the same time, it's like, it kind of veers further and further from our timeline. And uh, this, the particular project that we had in the show was a, a shadow library, um, basically looking at, we use kind of like existing photographs of the Guantanamo library to create this like reading room of every book that's been um, banned from the Guantanamo library. And I don't know, the, the artifacts and documents included in this work are real items from the timeline, real documentation of real things that have happened at this very real prison. And, you know, in relationship to existing archival initiatives about Guantanamo by human rights groups or legal scholarship in institutions, I think what it does that's, that's different by presenting that archive kind of in the register of museology and history is it suggests, it sort of has this demanding, insistent, quality to it. It's, it's like, it's not really a speculation so much as a promise that perhaps we could live in a world where the United States is capable of being this self-aware of its own history. Um, and I don't really know if America is actually a place that is capable of that. And I kind of feel, and there's an element of kind of preemptively trying to construct that world that is very risky, but that's kind of why it makes the most sense to kind of approach from the framework of speculative narrative and, and literature. Um, you know, so much of kind of this existing media ecosystem and critique ecosystem of outrage of platforms sort of vacillates between triage um, at best and kind of shouting into the void at worst. Um, and the rhetoric of accountability has sort of become this grotesque skin suit worn by corporate monsters. And what I, I guess I hope to find in directly positioning liability and, and taking sort of an orthogonal speculative position to imposing that liability as a way to kind of introduce a new narrative is hopefully something that is both imaginative enough to inspire creative action from more pragmatic disciplines and something provocative enough to be kind of too volatile to be turned into yet another skin suit. Um, whether or not, you know, I end up with a world where Mark Zuckerberg actually has to answer to the Hague, which frankly is unlikely, and even if he did, he'd send his legal counsel instead, or a world in which you know maybe Mark Zuckerberg only owns like four houses. Um, I still I think it's that there is a world kind of to be built and a future to be fought for, and it will be imperfect and it will be fraught, but it will happen at all. Thank you. Hi, Jessa. Thanks so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, can, so I was thinking about, so there's a couple people who have started to talk about um, 
you know, unionizing Facebook folks, mm -hmm. which came in a very surprising place to me. Some, some folks at Microsoft, like um, mm -hmm. Jerome Lanier and an economist, Glenn Weil, and they're talking about like unionizing Facebook workers, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. So that's one way of sort of manifesting some of your ideas. But I was also thinking about narratives of like redistribution of wealth, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of like more of a land-based practice. So there's different models for thinking about, and I'm like, so I'm willing to go with you on this speculative journey. I'm like so willing. So within that like spirit, like what are some of the models of redistribution of agency or money or privacy or data are you most attracted to? I mean, in sort of a like tangible sense, the idea of sort of just like litigation is like it's sort of it's it's both like kind of frivolous insofar as it's like it's may, may just end up being kind of burning money for lawyers but is also something where um it's kind of it still has some veneer of legitimacy to like institutions like if you were just like just give us your money then like it's a little bit harder like it's kind of just it's like you're just kind of the the proletariats at the gates of menlo park um i think that uh we think kind of like I th and I think like one of the things that Laurel's like kind of gestures to is something that Lanier has written about, which is this idea of sort of this like micro transactional, like we all own Facebook, which is fraught. I think that Nathan Schneider's position on like if we kind of turned Twitter into a collectively owned company, the way that like the Green Bay Packers is collectively owned by the people of Green Bay, I think that's that's slightly not as um it doesn't lend itself to like a terrifying libertarian like content farm economy thing, which I feel like Linear's proposition sort of moves towards. Hi. Hi. Um, I am Leslie. I am a Hi. PhD candidate. Um, and I wanted to ask you what you thought about, since you're talking about, um, you've talked about videos being potentially used as, um, you know, uh, an archive, a, a historical record for violence. And then I'm thinking the tension between that and sort of a collectivist uh, ownership of social media is that so much of the media on Facebook and Twitter is actually violence against um, uh, the bodies of people of color and Facebook is actually profiting off of that. Yeah. So I guess one provocation for the collective collectivist ownership model would be how do we actually take into account who's who's being used as sort of the consumable mm -hmm. fuel on which Facebook runs? Um, because it doesn't seem actually that it would be equal, even though it's easy to imagine just distributing it, you know, one to one would result in some sort of equity. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the the ways in which the companies kind of handle you know, violent media on their platforms and sort of either try to kind of make it go away or like have these like awkward, like we take it away and then people get mad and then we put it back and like either way, it's like it's still really like poorly kind of managed um, is another piece of like, I think it, it in the sense that, the, sorry, I'm trying to finish this sentence. Um, I think at the end, like it's in some ways again, it's, it's that's that like fraught like trust problem. It's like I don't really trust Facebook to manage these these problems. I don't know who I would trust. I I don't really trust the state either. Um, and I don't think that it's like oh we'll just give it to the people, but is is entirely an answer. Um, I think it's more that like giving people a way to like making Facebook like have to more directly answer to people. I think is kind of part of it is it's not necessarily like if Facebook continues to be in charge, then the lines of communication between them and users have to become a lot more effective than the kind of like generalized at scale interactions that currently exist. And I don't really know if they're willing to throw enough bodies at the problem, like have enough content moderators to actually manage that. Hi. Thank you. Um, I agree with the, the general arc of what you were saying, but I hope you don't mind me trying to correct a couple of things. Please, please do. I think Philadelphia, if you went over a pothole and your car flipped over, the city has rules that says that they're not responsible at all. Most cities are like that. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, German companies were broken up after the war. It didn't, didn't happen a lot, but RJ Far AJ, IG Farben was, and I think Bayer was, and other companies. Uh, and also Krupp, and there were three executive um, uh, trials mm -hmm. of executives after the war 
including IG Farben, uh, the Flick Company, and and uh, uh, I guess uh, Krupp. Mm -hmm. And while the they didn't quite know what to do with these guys, a lot of them got off. Mm -hmm. I think it shows the difficulty of doing something like that. They tried, yeah. but they couldn't really do anything. Yeah. The larger thing about Facebook being a publisher, my sense of why they don't want to be called a publisher and have been pushing back so much around it is because their goal is to make money off of other publishers. Mm. And the big problem with Facebook now is publishers are scarce stiff of them. They've been going back and forth about whether or not they're helping publishers or, hate, or hurting publishers. And for a while they were saying, we're not the publishers, the Times and Atlantic and others go on our site, mm -hmm. we'll make some money off you, and then you can be our, you know, our portal will help. And now they're turning away from that totally mm -hmm. and going in the other direction. So I really think it's not so much because of uh, fear of libel or anything mm -hmm. like that, because there are rules that would protect them. Mm -hmm. in that regard. I think it's really a matter of how they see themselves making money. Yeah, I think, so first kind of to your point, thank you for kind of acknowledging that there is kind of a context for holding corporate actors accountable. Um, I think that it's it's notable that it that emerged for German companies in particular. And the reason I brought up IBM as an example is because IBM was an American company that was engaged in acts of collusion. And so transnational companies, I think, that's that's the unique challenge that an American company like Facebook or YouTube kind of presents in this particular situation. Like, what does it mean for someone in Menlo Park to be making decisions that end up infect affecting people thousands of miles away? Um, and I, I think that, and there's also kind of a, an element of like, the, the actors who are willing to kind of take those steps tend to be the ones for like, who, who lost, for lack of, you know, like there's, there's some element of like, the willingness of like Germany to kind of like address that wrong partly had to do with the fact that there was a lot of existing apparatuses saying like maybe you need to rethink this whole this whole setup you had and um, for the the thing about like libel versus like simply kind of not wanting to like like having some complicated relationship with the media I think the recent decisions the company has made <laughs> related to announcing like they're making this change to the news feed to me like it's it's actually like. I think that's it's not about libel, but it is maybe about sort of alighting certain kinds of possibilities for regulation, right? Like, because they've performed this really elaborate gesture of like, we have tried to address this problem and this is what we have come up with. And when something terrible happens, like if there's kind of yet another sort of like mass misinformation campaign that spreads via a certain like propagation of information via the news feed, they can say, yes, but we tried. We tried to set up these like, we tried to set up this like different way of like prioritizing content that would not surface these the the news objects so it's not our fault like I think there is still like there's a there is a liability component to it um, but I think it's it's more kind of like they can see that it's going to be harder and harder for them to act as though like we had no idea that our platform could be used this way and so their actions are kind of about prepare like kind of dodging that like we has become the, the sort of poster person for that. Mm. You know, the New York Times piece that was quite long about um, influencers. Yeah. And the whole destruction of the notion of influencers. Mm -hmm. uh, because And Twitter seems to be quite aware of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, Twitter, I, like, in some ways, I feel like, like Twitter kind of gets off easy, I think, in a lot of these conversations because, like, everyone sort of quietly agrees that Twitter is, like, too incompetent to, like, do anything about the problem. Like, it's like, I just imagine, like, these three children standing on each other's shoulders wearing a trench coat, and that's, like, who runs Twitter. Um, like, there's there's some ways in which, like, they, they know things are so, like, they do. They know things are really, really broken and don't act on it just because it's, like, no one really is sure this company is going to keep existing. Like, I think there's, like, which in contrast to, like, it's like, well, we can't possibly imagine not having Facebook. Um, there's sort of a sense, like, Twitter could, like, disappear tomorrow. That's often how I feel when I use that tool. Yeah. Um, insofar as Facebook is a kind of black-boxed walled garden par excellence, have you considered infrastructural uh, mm -hmm. solutions, or are you maybe suspicious of transparency as just another kind of fetish that Facebook puts forward as a de facto solution 
Um, when you say infrastructural solutions, what are you what are you thinking making of? Making the processes more transparent, making the platform more open, or do you feel like that's just a kind another dead end? I mean, it, like it's interesting, like the way because I think like they they will open a lot of things on their own terms, like like going through the like selection of like things you can export from your timeline. Um, like it, there's a ton of widgets, you get a lot of stuff. Um, but it's kind of like I think some of the more interesting things are the stuff that it's like it wouldn't occur to anybody to save, like. Um, you can download every ad you've ever clicked on, but you can't download every ad that's ever been served to you. They don't know. They haven't kept track of that. They don't care. They just, they like, it's just, this is just kind of like floating material in the wind. At best, that sort of stuff gets documented when someone sees a weird ad and screenshots it. Like, so some of it's kind of like deciding like, what, what do you think is like your data that you want to be preserving? And like, how is that kind of preserved or like made something that's like yours? Um, yeah, in terms of infrastructure, like I'm, I just sort of fundamentally don't trust them. <laughs> um, so whether or not, like, and I think that, um, yeah, it's it's a lot. There's a lot of kind of gestures towards kind of openness that the company has made that have generally been more about kind of creating terms under which they're willing to engage than necessarily. Yeah. I get this question a lot, so I'm hoping you can, I can punt it to you and you can help me. Um, are there, so when you look at my mainstream, not which there aren't that many, mainstream articles that I've written about social media, the headlines are always like super anti-Facebook. Like you would think yeah, yeah, that yeah. I just like have a, 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 like a bat in my room that I'm just like yeah, yeah, yeah. on Facebook all the time. And people ask me like, um, what are the social media platforms that you can like believe in? You know. So, do you have a good answer on that? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, I, I do honestly like. I wish that I could believe that like Mastodon was like actually the future. I would like love for that to be true. I don't know if we're like too far gone for that to be the case. Uh, no, like we as like a society, like like whether or not the idea of like federated open source social media that you can port from platform to platform, it's like all of those things sound great. We have it. The technology exists. No one wants to manage and implement it. I mean, people like in small amounts, but it's like it's that idea that like it's not it's not going to replace the kind of ad engine behemoth um, or it's very unlikely that it would. Uh, yeah, and I guess like I we were talking about this before before the talk like the way that like when when facebook comes up people talk about it as though like they sort of like apologize for how they use like oh it's just for events or i just need to check in with my mom like i'm not i don't like this like this sort of weird sense of like guilt and or like shame like i don't really care that much if people use facebook or like i don't that's not really like i'm not like everyone should quit like that's not the point it's more like what what would like making this into something that kind of actually owed something to a public and acted on like that look like. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh, thank you for this talk. It was great. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I guess I'll start with, with one, which is more, um, I spent a lot of time reading terms of service uh, statements and no one taught me how to do that. And I guess I'm just wondering how you approach that endeavor, like reading I mean, terms of service. Yeah, you know, just like the like how you like how you go through that, how you deal with like your like emotional responses to it, but also thinking about, you know, are you sitting there thinking about terms of service based on different platforms, and just what advice do you if if you do that or if you don't do that? What advice do you have to people who are navigating that process? So I I found reading like our. Surya and I, our initial foray into kind of reading terms of service was like reading the diffs, like actually saying, like going to the Internet Archive, getting every version of the terms of service available and sort of comparing them. And that I found was like, that's a kind of useful, like actionable way, I guess, to read them, because rather than being like, I have to like go through every single line, it's like start with like, where are the changes happening and why? Because that's usually where something important is going on or something kind of like really minute, but sort of interesting, like, uh, like there's one jump like post IPO in the terms of service where Facebook says that you can't make a dating app using like the Facebook platform and like the, the API's tools. 
And it's like such a it's such a like minor thing where it's like why did you feel like you needed to add that? And the reason they did was because they had an exclusive agreement with Tinder. But like it's a sort of like way of kind of learning like finding other pieces of the history of a company, um, having something also to compare it to, like trying to like see like what it's become or is like I feel like giving it kind of a context. That's that's been a useful way to make it not merely sort of like an exercise in like processing the TDM. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I spent a lot of time being worried that we're spending a lot of time on the titans in the social media world, mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, and there's so much fluidity with a lot of the smaller apps that are, some of them are crashing and burning, and some of them are just taking off within very collected communities. Mm -hmm. Um, so even in dating apps, right? Yeah. Um, I'm kind of obsessed with dating apps right mm. now and understanding them. And I guess I'm just wondering how you grapple with that reality too in your own life because we have limited time, limited energy, like, yeah, like limited time for the apps, I but mean, they're yeah, all I different, right? Yeah. And like, I didn't even really, like, I really didn't want to care about Facebook. I like really want to be like, fuck you, not important, not my problem, I'm not even on you. But um, there's a way in which it's, it's like this, like that certain, Things become unavoidable. Uh, I think one one like piece of it, like in turn, is like looking at how how the big kind of how the big titan companies like germinate into the other kind of smaller markets. Like thinking about the fact that a lot of these giant companies are also data broker, like they're selling content, to, it's selling and selling like user data to all of these smaller players, and seeing it sort of as like a pyramid scheme, um, and then looking at sort of the ecosystem of how this stuff kind of flows within all of these companies. Um, so it's not necessarily like, like I'm not like uh, like whether it's like this one or that one or that. It's more like what's kind of the political economy of the larger kind of environment. Yeah. Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my turn. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I as I love your idea of thinking about a world without Facebook. I often think you know, what the world would be like without Facebook. But I'm wondering like. To what extent do you think it might be helpful to, to try to interrogate a little bit more the difference between what Facebook does and what it is? Mm -hmm. Because I, I often, like, I think a lot about materiality and infrastructure, and I like to think about Facebook and um, services like the Microsoft Cloud and Amazon Web Services, not as, like, platform companies, but as, a, as, as real estate companies. Mm -hmm. Because Facebook, like, when it comes down to, to like, brass tax and, like, the material of Facebook, it's about it's about either building real estate, uh, as in data centers and things like mm -hmm. that, or, or leasing real estate. And, it's an, it, and Facebook is inextricably entangled with all sorts of other cloud companies like Amazon mm -hmm. Web Services and things like that. And, and it needs to, when it doesn't have the functional infrastructure, it needs to lease space from other companies. And so mm -hmm. I, I just I, I don't know. Do you think do you think it, it's productive to maybe start thinking about Facebook like? Maybe maybe start thinking about it not in terms of uh, of its outsized social effects, but like thinking about what it actually materially is. And I think it's more in lines of real estate. That's an that's an interesting kind of parallel. Um, I think that like the one of the things that's also come up in this like these conversations with people being like, I'm not I'm I, I'm sorry I use it, but I just I need to know about the shows thing mm -hmm. is. Um, is that it makes, I become really curious about like everything that person ignores to be able to get to the thing they want. Cause that's usually what, like to them, what Facebook is, is this thing to know about events. And what Facebook is kind of in this broader scheme is like all of the crud <laughs> that they wade through to get to the events and thinking about ways to um, highlight that particular component. Like uh, right now the best we've got is kind of like Chrome extension, basically like annotating all of the garbage um, on your timeline, um, which is not the opposite, I think, of what generally people want. People prefer ad blockers that make that stuff go away, and we've mostly been, been like, how do we how do we make it like really hard not to look at the shit you're ignoring? Um, I think the real estate comparison is compelling. It's um, I think it's a little more complicated for like relative to like an AWS or like Microsoft. It's like a little bit more complex insofar as like. People like it's a, like the way that people build their companies off of Facebook infrastructure is very different from the way that people build their companies off AWS's infrastructure. Um, but I think that the idea of um, of like property 
as like a, a, a component of and like the treatment of data as a certain kind of property and who and like where it kind of belongs or doesn't is is an interesting line of inquiry. Yeah. Picking up on that because I think it's actually pretty interesting. I was thinking that in some ways Amazon is taking the place of Facebook hmm. for a certain strata of at least the American population. And, and in terms of both real estate and kind of the, the more online app type ways of thinking about the world. I mean, it's, all, it's more transparent in some ways than Facebook, but probably Amazon knows at least as much about people through the web services plus and, and through, through what you purchase mm -hmm. and also where you go now in Whole Foods. Right. Um, compared to, uh, and other things, I mean, they own, they own, um, uh, what's one called? Rotten Tomatoes. Right. And, yeah, or IMDB, one of the two. Um, they own a lot of stuff. Yeah, you know, and, and stuff like that. So, so it, it, yeah, they own, so I'm just wondering, in a way, it's, it's more hidden. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, uh, the game of sort of like which company is the most powerful or the worst, it's like they're all, they just do things in slightly different ways. Um, I think what's interest, like Facebook interests me is like a way of thinking about, um, both about like media and like what we kind of decided like media companies are, are and, and also in um, the way that like kind of content as evidence becomes sort of this liability object. Um, Amazon is interesting to me as a logistics company, like and I've kind of like, holding it and just kind of assuming that that's what it is and not really treating it as anything else I find useful um, because that makes a lot of their like motives and decisions a lot more like obvious. Um, I'm also in a kind of complicated, for complicated reasons, I can't go that deep on Amazon no matter how much I want to, which I can talk about later, but not on tape. Yeah, I made a mistake. It's Tomatoes is owned by Warner Brothers. Okay. IMDB is owned by uh, Amazon. <coughs> Hi. I don't have this fully sorted out, uh, but excellent talk, by the way. Uh, I'm trying to think of Facebook at, uh, in the developing world. Mm -hmm. Your talk seems to like be coming from a place where the environment is cynical about what mm -hmm. Facebook is. While uh, in a lot of countries, some more successfully than others, Facebook pits itself as like a moral actor that's mm -hmm. going to help all the people. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of like how you take that into account for your project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, I think also like well, and, and I think the sit, like situations in the developing world are also like a really interesting challenge to their like popularity does not equal dominance position because like like I said before like like the internet the de facto internet in Burma is Facebook like there is there's kind of an unavoidable they have like an unavoidable degree of like kind of responsibility <laughs> in that in that context I think but it's like. I'm not the attorney who's going to make the really complicated duty of care argument about that. Um, I think some of it's like looking at the ways that they kind of like looking at also like kind of how how deep their outreach really goes. Like how many offices do they actually have in that place? How many people do they actually have working there who aren't third party contractor or content moderators? Like the 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 kind of actual like depths of their relationships and kind of challenging those within the context of like their message and image. Um, that's one thing. And I don't know, like also thinking, like looking at kind of the relationships they have to particular states. Like I was talking to, um, a friend this past weekend who was basically just giving me the, like everything terrible happening in India right now, like rundown and was like, yeah, well, and like Modi and Zuckerberg are best friends. So like, you don't actually, like a lot of this stuff doesn't actually come through on my timeline. Like, and it's not that like there's some deliberate like censorship model going, it's more just like the permeation of that like particular platform and the way that kind of news gets distributed has sort of undermined a lot of that. So that that's like a kind of a not a super helpful answer, but I guess it's that like, um, I don't know if it's my job to like convince every person on the planet that Facebook has problems, but look at the specific kinds of problems they have in different contexts. And maybe they can be great for some people. I don't know. Maybe. I don't have a great track record. It's also the, the thing of like the kind, like they're willing to accept the successes, but not necessarily the shortcomings. Like it's the, the fact that like 
you know, when, like, during the 2012 IPO, they were like, man, Tahrir Square, we totally did that, which is, like, a year before that, they were like, we had no part in that. But when it became convenient, they were, like, these heroic, like, kind of actors for free speech. But when the 2016 election happens, when Brexit happens, they're like, there's no way that that could have been us. We had no part, you know? Like, which, which particular things are they willing kind of to own as a part of being this powerful? Yeah. Um, I have a GitHub related Great. question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I unfortunately didn't get to attend the Guantanamo Bay exhibition that mm -hmm. you referenced in your talk, but I guess I'm a little, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, how we talk about Gitmo and what is archived from Gitmo. And in the beginning, I, I really saw it. Uh, as a distinct, isolated, unique case. Mm -hmm. And lately I've been doing more thinking about how really there are, there are some interesting connections between, say, the Guantanamo Bay Detainee Library and, say, the Parwan Detention Library, which was where there were um, Quran burnings in Afghanistan. And even more importantly, there are still connections between the policies at the U.S. military base in Gitmo and, say, the naval base in Guam. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm just wondering to what extent, if any, have you been thinking about the bigger question of military archives beyond Gitmo, or mm -hmm. thinking about how archives related to Gitmo are divergent from mm -hmm. what, we, what we have in other contexts, either those involving, say, the Part 1 detention facility in Afghanistan, which did have its own library and obviously had its own complicated history. Uh, we don't talk about censorship as much, partially, partially because it's hard to get. Yeah. It, you have to file FOIA requests, which take years, and mm -hmm. I've been down that road. But I guess I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts on that as a as a general set of issues. Um, I don't know if those are issues I'm entirely like qualified to speak on. Like I curated someone else's project about a particular site's uh, prison library into an exhibition. Um, I think that um, kind of maybe this is answering more towards this larger thing of like transitional justice and uh, trying to think through what it is to kind of remember horrible things <laughs> that happen. Um, I, I think that like drawing those threads across like histories is like very like very potent and like valuable. And I, the hard part I think is that like is kind of containing and thinking about the scale of these, like, so like, when I brought up the idea, like, so, you know, joking about sort of a post-truth irreconcilable differences commission, um, the sort of concern trolling response is like, oh, you can't have like a truth commission about what happened, like what's going to happen over the next four to God, I hope not eight years. Um, you have to like start with like, you know, the war on terror. And then it's like, well, you can't start with the war on terror. You have to start with Reagan. And like you kind of, and then you, like, it's like you go back to like the founding original sins of genocide and slavery. And it's like, yes, we need to deal with all of these things. How you deal with them and what paradigms you use for them do matter though. And to say like, we are going to like come to terms with literally everything that's ever happened in the entire history of the United States of America. Um, good, good luck. <laughs> um, I, I would like to see I think it's deciding kind of like how and where and who, in fact, because also like I am not qualified to be operating like those inquiries. I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about like who would America like take seriously in trying to do that sort of investigation. And I basically got like John Lewis and Oprah, um, like they, they could actually like they, they're like the closest I think we have to Desmond Tutu. Um, but which maybe that says more about America, but uh, but yeah, I think the, the thing you're describing of kind of connecting these across like this entire kind of apparatus of, of you know, prison libraries is like really beautiful and fascinating and something that merits like, I think it sounds like a really fantastic essay. I don't know how to kind of expand, put it into another frame. Sounds good. Cool, okay. Yeah. Uh, I just wanna know, like you, you, in the beginning you talk about this, idea of these sort of skinwalkers, this much lesser metaphor. And like in some in some parts of the talk it's like the your definition of monstrosity on Facebook seems to be like this uncanny uh, definition where it's, it looks like 
it is what it should be, but it's, it's really not. But and in others, it seems to be more about scale. So I guess like, uh, how are you or, or size rather, and, and how overpowering it is. So how are you mostly defining monstrosity uh, and taking this critical? Yeah, yeah, and you know, I'm I'm usually more often on team monsters than team mortals, but uh, as a metaphor, it's it's useful. I think like I think the uncanniness is kind of like a big part of like how the power kind of manifests itself, and what's sort of like unnerving or uncanny about it is that in fact underlying it is this massive scale. Maybe like if we were to compare it to like another kind of like skin, like literally like in Men in Black. Do you remember that like? Like that, that alien in a skin suit, which, you know, when he took the skin suit off was like quite enormous and like pretty, pretty intense and overwhelming, but like it's contained within this sort of like clumsy being. I never, I, I had not thought about the movie in so long. Thank you. So if there aren't any other questions, let's um, thank um, Ingrid Burrington for joining us.